I know you guys are devastated, but there's going to be no Learn My Test ad in this video. So I'm sure you guys are devastated that there's no Learn My Test ad in this one. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into what we're going to talk about. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is just that some different disorders with sleep. So these two are, so nightmare disorder is usually often occurs with kids and it, uh, and it, it commonly occurs with kids and it's usually just the kids having nightmares frequently. It's disrupting his sleep and it's causing him to have trouble during the day, to be irritable during the day. Night terrors are a little different. So night terrors are, there's a specific set of symptoms. So the person wakes up and literally is still sleeping and they start screaming um, and so that is the, uh, the night tear that's night tear. So it's not just, they're getting nightmares. It's like, you know, they're having really, really vivid nightmares that cause them to wake up. And then there's sleepwalking disorder, which, uh, often occurs in kids. It does, it's not common, but it occurs in kids more than adults. And usually when it happens, it subsides by adulthood. So most people that have it grow out of it. And what happens is there's a chemical that is released in your brain while you're sleeping and it paralyzes your body so that you don't walk around while you're sleeping. Because when you're in REM sleep, your brain is actually just as active as it is when you're awake. So when you're in REM sleep, your brain's active and you're, you don't act out your dreams because your body's paralyzed. But what happens is with, with sleepwalking, that chemical is not released or not enough of it is released. So the person will get up and start walking around. And a lot of times in adults, it's very, people are very, very violent in when they have uh, sleepwalking or sleep disorder. So there's a lot of things that they have to do to make sure that person doesn't, uh, doesn't hurt anyone. And there, there have been a couple cases where someone killed someone in their sleep and, and that person wasn't charged with a crime because of course they weren't awake. Uh, but it's, it's just some terrible situations that have happened. But uh, like I said, it's it's very, very rare condition. So the most common sleep disorder is insomnia. And I'm sure as college students, you guys may have experienced this before. And I, I can say, I'd safe to say I've experienced this, especially when I was in college, where you have trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, um, having daytime sleepiness that's disrupting your functioning. Uh, sleep apnea is a condition where your uh, breathing is disturbed while you're sleeping. Uh, there's two types of sleep apnea. So there's central and obstructive. The central sleep apnea is your brain. There's a mechanism in your brain that essentially disrupts your breathing. So um, generally in your brain stem, there's something that happens that's, that you stop breathing when you sleep. Um, and then obstructive sleep apnea is the most common. So it's basically, and it often occurs in people that are obese, and what happens is that there's uh, something blocking air from getting out when they're sleeping. And so what happens is they, when they see a physician, they'll get what's called a CPAP. And the CPAP machine blows air in, into um, the esophagus. And basically it allows air to, it, it allows you to breathe. And it, because that, that area that's blocking the breathing, it pushes air into it. So it's not blocking the breathing anymore. Um, so a big field for psychologists is that people have trouble wearing these. Um, they just, they have trouble wearing them. And what happens is when they don't wear them, they're not breathing enough in their sleep. So they're getting hypoxic and that can cause this condition called, um, atrial fibr atrial fibrillation, which is, um, AFib or it's a irregular heartbeat because they're not getting enough oxygen while they're sleeping. And so it's, it's really, it can be very serious and life-threatening if they don't have it treated. Obviously, if you're not breathing, you, you know, you're not going to be able to live. So, uh, so the CPAP is really important. So psychologists uh, often will work with people to make, to try to help them, you know, get into a regular routine of, of wearing their CPAP. So uh, that's sleep apnea. And then narcolepsy is a, basically where people have sudden sleep attacks. And these sleep attacks are often triggered by an emotional event. They, um, there's muscle weakness in their body that happens when they're awake. And then that, that's often triggered by a sleep attack. So I've had one client that I've had that had a, a, a sleep or narcolepsy. 
and it was interesting. Like he literally fell asleep um, in the middle of when I was testing him. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very serious condition. And so if you can think about our psychostimulants chapter that we're going to cover next time, stimulants are a, are the treatment for narcolepsy, because obviously if you want to keep someone awake and alert, you would give them a stimulant. So there's a circadian, uh, sleep rhythm. I think it's sleep rhythm disorders. And these are basically where people have really irregular work schedules and they, their, their sleep balance gets off because you know if you're a pilot and you have to stay up all night flying your plane um, and then you know you're awake during the normal day some days um, or if you're a physician if, if you're an ER doctor and you've got to stay work in the ER all night or if you work some third shift uh, your sleep schedule is not going to be on a normal pattern that most people get on and so that can just that can cause a lot of problems in functioning so um, insomnia treatment, I, I wanted to go over this because insomnia is the most common uh, sleep disorder and some of you guys may experience it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about it. So uh, you only want to be in your bedroom when you're sleeping and, and if you're, you have sex. Other reasons, there should be no other reason for you to be in your bedroom. And the other thing is if you're laying in your bed and you're not tired, um, what the research says is to get out of bed and go do something else until you're tired. Um, that's the best, that, that's one of the, uh, the biggest things. And also, actually, like I was talking about in the biopsych chapter, when you stare at your phone and there's a light coming from your phone, that light tells your brain not to release melatonin, which tells you to sleep. It tells your brain to release adrenaline. And what happens is that keeps you awake and, and so it's harder for you to sleep. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, turning the lights off and, and that, and making your house dark when you're ready to go to bed, that tells your brain to release melatonin. So just like the screens tell your brain to not release melatonin, release adrenaline, keeping your house dark tells your brain to release melatonin that makes you more tired and makes you want to, want to sleep. Um, so exercise during the day. So the more cal research set suggests the more calories you burn during the day, the, the more tired you are and the better sleep you get at night. Um, and so if you're having trouble sleeping, what you wanna do is you wanna stay up and you, you really don't wanna worry about the quality of sleep that you're gonna get while you're adjusting to your regular sleep pattern. So you wanna wake up at the same time every morning. So whatever that time is, you pick that time and you wake up at that time every morning, no matter what. And so if you wake up at that same time every morning, then, uh, then, like I said, you'll start to naturally get tired at at a time that's like you know eight hours before that. Usually, sometimes you won't, but on a regular, you'll get onto a regular schedule if you wake up at the same time, no matter how tired you are. And even if you're like extremely tired, or you didn't sleep, just try to stay up throughout the entire day and then go to bed um, the next night. Um, some good advice is to not eat before bedtime. So. Food is energy. So if you eat, your body's going to burn that off. That's going energy. And then you're going to, um, you know, you, it'll make you more awake. So if you don't eat for up to four hours before bedtime, that will, that will also help you stay tired. And then uh, if you think about it, our bodies are wired to be awake when the sun comes out or when the sun goes, or sorry, when the sun comes up and when the sun goes down, we're wired to, to want to go to sleep. So what happens when the sun comes up? there's light out so that that means our bodies respond to light we want to be awake when that when it's light and then when the sun goes down our bodies respond that way and we also um are we get tired when it's dark and the same is true with with temperature so remember when the sun goes up it's warm so when our bodies go from cold to warm it makes us it gives us um it gives us more we we stay awake <laughs> and then if if it goes from hot to cold that makes us tired. So uh, some people say if you take a hot shower, that's helpful because you get hot and then you get out and that, then you go from hot to cold and that makes you tired. But in general, if you keep your house colder, that's a good temperature to sleep at. So, um, and like I said, again, I know I've said this before, but if you're not tired, you know, and you're in bed, just get out of bed, wait until you get tired and then go back to bed. So just some basic tips on sleep hygiene. 
So one more thing I want to go over, and then we'll be finished with this unit. So Sigmund Freud uh, came up with some theories on dreams. So he suggested that uh, dreams are, are unconscious wishes or desires. And so in therapy, uh, you know, Freud uh, psychoanalysis therapy, which, you know, is Freudian psychotherapy, they would talk, you know, dreams were a big topic. Um, the activation synthesis hypothesis is the idea that dreams don't really... They're, they're literally just a result of your brain working. And so your brain's working and helping you store memories. And so what ultimately happens as a result of that is, is you have a dream. And uh, there's they don't have any like significance like Freud thinks. They're just, you know, a result of... My theory is that uh, how many of you, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here and none of you guys are out there, but I'm just thinking, uh, I'm sure probably a lot of you guys had a dream before where, you know, either got arrested or, you know, someone killed you or something happened or you were falling and you were just like, oh my God, like you, you're, you're like, my life is over. What happened? And then you wake up and you're like, oh my God, I'm glad that didn't happen. God, I, you know, this all didn't happen. I'm, my life is normal again. So I think, you know, dreams are a way for us to obviously store memories and things like that. But I also think it's a way for us to play out things in our mind uh, and and to play out certain scenarios in our mind. And when we're dreaming, if we do something stupid, we're not going to, you know, we won't die. So we can play out things in our mind and we can die in our mind. And um, that way we can we know not to do that when we wake up. So I think it's kind of a learning thing uh, for us. But again, that's my thought. And, uh, and, and so it's kind of in the middle of the activation synthesis and the Freud, the Freudian, uh, hypothesis. But anyway, thank you for watching this video and that this will conclude our section on sleep and dreams.